Good morning and welcome to this second week of Advent here at West Salem Christian Church. We are into the Christmas season. We're anticipating the birth of Jesus and we have so much to be grateful for, so much to worship God for, so much to give thanks and, and uh, praise Him for. So let's go into this time of worship uh, with, with anticipation, with hope, with joy uh, for what God has done for us through Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world. Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace. And makes the nations true The glories of His righteousness And wonders of His love And wonders of His love And wonders, wonders of His love Good morning. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read verses 2 through 7. Again, that is the book of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Well, would you join me now as we go before our zealous God? Oh, Father. You are the author and finisher of our salvation, the everlasting God, who has loved the world so much, you became human and dwelt among us. And as you walked among us, you opened the eyes of the blind, restored hearing to the deaf, healed the sick, restored the demon-possessed, and raised the dead. Like an unblemished lamb, you were sinless, and yet gave yourself willingly to the very people you created to be crucified as a criminal. Three days later, you were raised from the dead and victory over sin and death was declared one. You are now preparing our dwelling place in heaven and will return, not as a humble servant of sacrifice, 
but as king and judge of the world. Your grace of salvation through trusting faith is freely offered to all who believe. The church seeks to fulfill your mission to proclaim your gospel. Together we give humble thanks and glorify your name for being a part of this church. There are many people who still need your precious salvation and are blind to their need. We pray for your spirit and your word to overcome their state of unbelief as on the day of Pentecost. Each of us is praying for souls to be set free from the slavery of sin and death. And we picture them now and lift them up to you. Thank you for being our strength this week and for hearing our many prayers. Thank you for, for providing answers. We recommit in faith to trust you for these answers in your timing. Thank you for your forgiveness and restoration as we confess our sins to you. For those in our congregation who are suffering from health issues, we pray for healing. We pray for courage and faithfulness, not only for our own brothers and sisters in West Salem Christian Church, but for men and women of faith all around the world. We lift up our missionaries that we support, asking for you to provide for them with strength of faith as they minister to the lost. Father, as we worship today, both in person and online, we join together in a spirit of joy and anticipation of the glorious work you will do as your word is preached this day. May we be obedient to it as your servants and may lives be saved and changed for your glory. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. This is the second week of our Advent series for this year. Last week I mentioned that Advent is simply a word that means the arrival of a significant person or event, or it can mean the beginning or the initiation of something. And when we look at, the def at that definition, we can see that Advent is the perfect word to describe this season as we look forward with anticipation to the birth of Jesus. Christmas, the birth of Jesus, was the beginning and the initiation of God's ultimate plan for salvation and God's eternal kingdom being opened on earth here as it is in heaven. Last week, we talked about the advent of hope that we saw in the birth of Christ, the, the good news of great joy for all people that the angels announced to the shepherds, the hope that the shepherds found when they went and they saw Jesus for themselves, and, and they saw that everything was just as the angels had told them. We saw that we can do that same thing. We can come to Jesus. We can see that, that everything is just as God said it would be. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of God's prophecies and plans and promises. And when we come to him, when we see him for ourselves, we find that same hope and, and a hope that goes beyond trials in this life. It's a hope that extends to the highest heights and the deepest depths, a hope that never fails and a hope that we can then share with this world that's desperately in need. And today, as we look at the next, next aspect of the birth of Jesus, we'll see that it too is something that we and this world desperately need. Today, we will look at how the birth of Jesus brought with it the advent of peace. And of course, our minds can go in different directions when we think of peace. We can think of national peace, a time when our country is not at war. We can think of peace as an agreement or an understanding between groups of people or, or individuals. We can think of personal peace as times of quiet solitude, and we can think of peace as a choice to not be overcome by doubt or fear or worry, but to rest in an attitude of assurance. And when we look around our nation and our culture today, we don't see a whole lot of peace. Over the last six or eight years, it seems like the divisions in our culture have grown and become much more evident. There doesn't seem to be a lot of civil conversation or debate these days. Mostly, we just seem to hear people shouting over each other or trying to silence people who don't share their point of view. 
We just went through a hotly contested election, and a lot of what we saw from both sides was the dirty underbelly of politics. In America, our leadership can swing from one extreme to the other in an instant, and it can make us feel a lack of peace. But human leadership has always been that way. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And today, our scripture is from Isaiah chapter 9. And as we look at the context of that scripture, we see that God's people, because of their human king, their human leadership, were in a place without a lot of peace. Judah, the southern kingdom of God's people, had a king named Uzziah who had reigned for over 50 years. He, he'd built up the nation in a lot of ways. They were politically, militarily, technologically dominant. Uzziah really was a brilliant king. He had military machines that were built. He, he made scientific advancements in agriculture. The early part of his reign was a golden age for the kingdom of Judah. But then he got a little bit full of himself and he tried to go into the temple and burn incense as an offering, which was the sanctified job of the priests. And because of this, he was struck by God with leprosy, and he had to live in isolation for the last 11 years of his life, while his son then ruled in his place. But when Uzziah died, a king named Ahaz became king, and it didn't take him long to undo a lot of the progress that Uzziah had accomplished. He didn't follow God, he made alliances with people that he shouldn't have, and he did not listen to God's prophets. The prophet Isaiah warned him and told him, ask for a sign from God to confirm that what I'm saying to you is true, but Ahaz wouldn't listen. Isaiah basically then tells him, well, whether you want a sign or not, there is a sign coming. The people of Judah, God's people, and really the whole world at that point, they're at the mercy of the decisions of their king. But Isaiah points to a time when there will be a difference. So let's read Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 together and see what Isaiah says is coming. He says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. King Ahaz was worried that God wouldn't come through for his kingdom, and he wanted to depend on his own strength and intelligence. But this prophecy that Isaiah gives of the true king, the Messiah, it's a prophecy of a king whose kingdom and reign will exponentially expand without end. At the time when King Uzziah died. Uh, He had the reported standing army of 307,500 men. And by that number, we can extrapolate that there were over a million people that lived in the nation of Judah. That's a pretty big kingdom that that now Ahaz is responsible for, and, and he's afraid to trust God with it. But when compared with the kingdom of Jesus, it doesn't even register on the scale. It's estimated that just today, alive now in 2022, there are 2,560,000,000 Christians in the world. So just to put that into perspective, let's put those numbers in terms of seconds. Let's be generous and say that the kingdom of Judah had 2 million people. 2 million seconds adds up to about 23 days. The number of Christians living today, 2,560,000,000, that many seconds adds up to over 81 years. The kingdom of Jesus is exponentially and unendingly bigger and expanding farther. And his kingdom is not bound by borders or geography or race, language, currency, government, political system. He's eternal, and his kingdom is a heavenly eternal kingdom. Revelation 7, 9 gives us a picture of the kingdom of Christ. It says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. A multitude too big for any to count, from every people group and every nation on earth, and all of them shouting, saying, Praise to our King, King of Kings. And we're part of that. And we can have peace because Jesus is King. 
Our security and purpose, our meaning and value, our mission and allegiance is not tied to any human government, nation, or construct. Because of the birth of Jesus, when we accept him as Lord and Savior, we are part of his eternal heavenly kingdom. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be made like his glorious body. Yes, we live in a country, and I am grateful and proud to live here. Yes, we live under human leaders, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. Yes, we live in a culture and a society that has its blessings, and it definitely has its weaknesses. And there has been opposition to the message of Jesus and and, and to his church from the very beginning. Herod killed all the male babies in Bethlehem to try and stop him. The religious leaders opposed him at every turn. They even manipulated a way for him to be brutally executed. But none of that could change the fact that Jesus is king. And we can be grateful to God that our citizenship is in heaven and our king never fails. He is the prince of peace and his peace, to his peace, there will be no end. And that leads us to the next thing that we see in this prophecy from Isaiah this morning. Isaiah ties Jesus and his eternal kingdom with the covenants and the promises of God. What we see in scripture all the way through from beginning to end is that God is a God who operates in the context of covenant, starting with Adam and Eve, all the way through to now us today as his people and his church. God operates in covenanted relationship with his people. In the Old Testament, we see mainly three covenants. In the book of Genesis, we see that God makes a covenant with Abraham. God promises Abraham that he will bless him and and he'll give him a son and that through him, all people on earth will be blessed. And it's through that family line then that Jesus is born almost 2,000 years after that. And then later in the Old Testament, we see God establishes the Mosaic covenant with Moses and the Israelite people. He lays out for them what it looks like to be his people. He sanctifies them. He sets them apart. He tells them how to live out his will and what it looks like for a people and a nation to live out the heart of God. And it is amazing when they do it, but they fail over and over again. And after they've failed and the nation has split into two kingdoms, we see another covenant, a covenant that God makes with King David. In 1 Chronicles 7, 11 through 14, God gives this message for David. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. So here God makes an unconditional promise to David that there will be an everlasting throne, there will be an eternal king, and there will be an everlasting kingdom. And in this, we see that we can have peace because God honors his covenants. Through the birth of Jesus, God fulfills this promise to David, and he fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that we read earlier. Both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke have extensive genealogies of Jesus, and it's because the way in which Jesus was born, the family he was born into, the place that he was born, all of it demonstrates the faithfulness of God and that he keeps his covenants that he makes with his people. And if we build our life and our faith on the faithfulness of God, if we choose to build our lives on the strong foundation of the one that we see keeps his covenants, That's the ultimate and enduring source of peace in this life. Because God does keep his promises, and that means that he will never leave us or forsake us. That means that we are more than conquerors. That means that no one can snatch us out of his hand. That means that he has forgiven us and that he remembers our sins no more. It means that he's given us his spirit to teach us and to remind us of his word. It means that the name of Jesus is a name that is above every other name. It means that he's gone to prepare a place for us, and it means that he's coming back again. He promised those things, and God keeps his covenants. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. 
I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. God is a God of covenants and he keeps his promises. The birth, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the turning point of all history, the fulfillment of all the promises that came before that and the beginning of all the promises that God has made to us. Life, it's going to be difficult. There are going to be hard times. We are going to be frustrated and confused. But when we see the faithfulness of God, we have great reason to find peace in him. And when we trust God and and trust in his faithfulness, then we can truly let Jesus rule. We can truly let Jesus be king because a lot of times we're like King Ahaz that we talked about earlier. We want want to be God's people, but we hesitate to actually follow where he leads because Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus isn't a prophecy about him being uh, an advisor to us. Isaiah doesn't tell us that Jesus is going to be the best life coach that you could ever find. He doesn't describe a great teacher. No, Isaiah speaks about Jesus ruling and reigning forever. And he says he will establish a kingdom. And the best way for us to find peace is to let Jesus reign. Because he's the only one who actually has the authority and and who actually knows how. We can have peace because Jesus rules in justice and righteousness. When we try to reign in our own lives, we never end up doing it with justice and righteousness. When we reign in our own lives, we dish out justice for other people and we resolve, reserve all the grace for ourselves. What happens when we're reigning in our own lives and someone does something against us? When someone wrongs us somehow? Our first response is usually to want to punish them. We want revenge or retribution. We're ready to deal out our version of justice, which is usually not very just and usually not very gracious. If we're reigning in our own strength, despite maybe having good intentions, we cannot reign in justice and righteousness. We don't have what it takes. And if we're trying to reign in our own lives, what happens when we make a mistake or when we come up short? Do we do very well at giving justice to ourselves? Usually not. We usually want to try to deflect or or redirect the blame away from ourselves and onto somebody else. We do pretty well with patience and grace for us, but we want to dish out justice onto someone else, even for our own mistakes. And sometimes we can even go overboard in the other direction. We can, out of shame or guilt, pile judgment and wrath on ourselves. We can beat ourselves up continuously for making a mistake in the past. Even when we've done all that we can to to make amends, even when we've asked God for forgiveness, sometimes then we can struggle to forgive ourselves. Whichever way we look at it, We struggle when we try to reign in our own lives, in our own strength. We struggle to rule in justice and righteousness because we don't have the ability or the authority to really do that. That's why we have to allow Jesus to be the one to rule and reign in our lives because he can rule perfectly in justice and in righteousness. We surely need to work toward justice. We absolutely need to live in righteousness and call others to do the same. Even though people try to criticize the church through the centuries. Everywhere you look around the world, places where followers of Jesus have been at work, you see justice being done. I heard a man uh, speak once who had been a missionary in Africa. He had been working with the teaching, uh, working with and teaching the people of a particular tribe. And the chief of that tribe had come to faith in Jesus. And he came to the missionary with a question. He said, I have seven wives and each of those wives have given me children. But when I look at the Bible, it says that I should have just one wife and devote myself to her. And how do I do that? And the missionary didn't give him an answer, but he invited him to meet regularly to study the Bible and to pray and to ask God to show him the answer. After several weeks of doing this, the chief decided that the right thing to do would be to live with the woman that he married first, devote himself to her as her husband but to also then continue to provide for and support the other wives and children. That way he was honoring God and honoring the people who he was responsible for. If he was operating in his own strength, he probably would have just either chosen to continue to live how he was or just cut the other wives and children off. But when he let Jesus rule in his life, he was able to choose a path of justice and righteousness. And everybody wants that, whether you're a Christian or an atheist or anywhere in between. People want their life, and they want this world to be just and right. 
People want the world to be like the kingdom of God because it is just and right. But often we want the world to be like the kingdom without having to be subject to the king. But the truth is there is no kingdom without the king. If we want peace, if we want justice and righteousness, it's a package deal. If we want the kingdom, the only way to get it is to let the king of kings reign in our lives. Jesus is the king. He is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. The government is on his shoulders. He rules in justice and righteousness, and his reign will never end. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And Ephesians 1 tells us that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, Jesus is on his throne. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the King of Kings. So let's let the King reign in our lives. And when we do, we can enjoy the peace of knowing that we are secure in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the peace that we can have. This world doesn't provide much peace. When we try to reign in our own lives, we end up destroying a lot of peace for us and for other people. So help us to trust that you keep your promises because we've seen that you do. Help us to choose your kingdom, which is a place of peace. And we pray that your kingdom would come in our lives and on this earth as it is in heaven. But we most of all pray that you'd help us to choose every single day to let Jesus reign in our lives because we know that's where true peace comes from and that's how we experience your kingdom is to let the king reign. So we thank you that Jesus is king and that we can know him, can live for him and allow him to reign in our lives. And we thank you in his name. Amen. In Luke 1, 46 through 55, we find what has, been come, what has come to be known as Mary's song. Mary had been visited by an angel, told that she was going to, even though she's a virgin, give birth to the Messiah, the Son of God. In her culture at that time, she would have been ostracized. She would have been rejected and looked down on, being an unmarried young woman who was pregnant. So she was probably feeling a, a lot of emotions at that point. So she goes to the home of her cousin, Elizabeth. And when she gets there, she is greeted by Elizabeth with joy and thankfulness and praise to God that, that uh, God would bless Elizabeth by, by having the, 
mother of the Lord, come to visit her. And Mary is encouraged by this, and it gives her assurance that, that God really is doing something and that she is, is part of God's plan. And so as we come to communion today, I think that maybe we can feel a little bit of what Mary felt. We know when we come to communion that we're not perfect. We know that there are reasons why we shouldn't be accepted. And yet, when we come to communion, because of what Jesus has done, we're accepted. We're welcomed to this meal. It's a joyous occasion. It's a time to celebrate the relationship that we have with Jesus because he paid the price for us. So I think maybe we can echo some of these things that Mary expresses in her song. Here is what she sang. It says, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And I think we can say with Mary, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And so we take the bread to remember the body of Jesus that was given for us. And we take the juice to remember his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for saving us. We glorify you and our, our soul praises you because you were mindful of us. We are humble people and it's a humbling thing to come to this table at communion to realize the price that was paid for us for the mistakes that we made, the things that we could not repay on our own. Jesus, the King of Kings, your son was willing to lay down his perfect, precious life to pay for us. You have been mindful of us, your humble servants, and we're grateful for that. So we pray that you would help us to find ways to serve you, to live for you, to honor you with our praise and our worship and with our lives as we live to give you glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our time of giving. Each year we do a special Christmas offering that we call the Big Give. It's a special offering over and above our normal tithes and offerings for the everyday operation of the church. Each year we set a goal to meet the needs of the projects that we're raising money for. And in addition, we set a miracle goal. The miracle goal is above the normal goal that we've set and, and would allow us to do even more than we had planned for. Some of the projects that we include in our Big Give have to do with our needs as a, a church. And some are focused on missions and, and projects outside of the church. The Big Give will go on from now through the end of January. So this year, our goal for the Big Give is $3,500. $1,600 of that will be set aside to purchase a new computer for Laura uh, in the office, as well as some updated software that she really needs to make her ministry here at the church much easier. $500 will be used to buy thank you gifts for the teachers and the staff at Chapman Hill Elementary School that we can give to them uh, to, to uh, encourage them as they come back to school after the first of the year. $400 will be used to buy socks or underwear to give to church at the park for their room in the inn ministry that they run every year for the needy in, in the community of Salem. And $1,000 will be sent as special Christmas gifts to the missions that we support, Wynema Christian Camp, OCEF Church Planters, and Toby and Jesse Farkercher and their family as well. And beyond that, our 
miracle goal for this year is $8,000 total. And that would be a goal beyond all of the other projects. And any of that additional money that comes in would go toward the property enhancement fund here at the church. We have a lot of things around the building and the grounds that are going to need to be taken care of in the next year. From the roof to the carpet to the parking lot, there are a lot of areas that just need attention. So we want to take care of the, those main projects first, but anything that comes in toward that miracle goal will help us to start on our way to taking care of the maintenance and the upkeep of our facilities that really need it. It's important to give toward the regular operation and ministry of the church, and I want to encourage you to do that, but it's also an exciting opportunity to give toward these extra special projects. So if you'd like to give toward the big give, uh, there's an option in the drop down menu on the website or the Tithely app. If you give digitally, you can give your regular tithes and offerings that way. And then you can choose the, uh, the designated fund of the, the big give if you'd like to give to that. You can also, uh, if you mail a gift to the church, you can uh, designate that to either the Christmas offering or just the big give. God has been faithful through the years, and he's helped us to reach our goal each year that we've had a Christmas offering. And I'm excited to see uh, what he's going to do through us and, and uh, with us this Christmas season. Well, thank you again for being here for worship, for making time to, to spend time worshiping God and thanking him and, and praising him for all that he's done through Jesus. And, and I want to invite you back next week. Um, we'll be continuing through our Advent series, looking forward to Christmas here. And uh, we'll be meeting at 1030 a.m. here online and uh, at the church building in person at that same time. Let's pray as we get ready to sing our closing song this morning. Father, you have given us uh, so many good gifts, but as we think about uh, this season of giving and Christmas and, and the gifts that we give and receive from each other, we are so grateful for the gift of Jesus, that he is, is continually blessing us and giving us new and wonderful gifts every single day. Uh, and, and we are grateful for that, and, and we want to, uh, to live in a way that shows we're grateful. We want to respond to what you have done, and we want to love you and love other people because you have loved us so well. And we thank you uh, for the way that we see that through Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen.
Oh, no. 